Hi, Paul. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let me introduce this. I am uh, Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show on Meaning Life TV. You are Paul Knitter, the um, Paul Tillich Professor Emeritus of Theology, World Religions, and Culture at Union Theological Seminary, um, where, as it happens, I am a visiting professor of science and religion this year. Uh, my first exposure to Union was actually talking to your class about four yeah, years ago. Yeah, I remember that very well. First mm -hmm. time I was there. So thanks mm -hmm. for that introduction. Sure. Um, now, today we are going to be talking <clears throat> largely about your book, Without Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian, uh, because, uh, as the book explains, Buddhism has become a large part of your spiritual identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll find out exactly how large, I guess, by by talking to you about it, and 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 we'll talk about the larger business of living in a religiously pluralistic world, mm -hmm. which is something you've been writing about for a long time, and and how mm -hmm. religions cannot help but encounter one another and kind of reckon with with one another in one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and we'll be talking about parallels as you see them between Christian and Buddhist ideas. Um, I, I would like to start, though, with a little curiosity that I came across while perusing your Wikipedia <clears throat> entry. It turns out uh, that you came in for a little criticism from uh, Pope Benedict before he was Pope Benedict <laughs> when he was Cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger, and and I guess his job was to be kind of the guardian of church doctrine, right? I mean... Yeah, he was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican. Which, which, the old... which was the office that had evolved from the office that did the Inquisition, right? Exactly. <laughs> so that must be an unpleasant feeling when the guy in charge of the Inquisition starts uh, starts knocking on your door. What, what was your What was your offense? Well, um, it, it there were actually two occasions when it was while I was teaching at Xavier University uh, in Cincinnati, a Catholic, a Jesuit university, um, and some very conservative Catholics in the. Archdiocese of Cincinnati had written to to Rome to 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 Ratzinger uh, to complain about me, um, and he then in the congregation uh, for the doctrine of the faith sent letters then to the bishop, the local bishop, at the time, and they also uh, arrived at the president uh, president's office, the president of Xavier University, and the 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 main issue, Bob, was what is still a rather neuralgic point within um, Catholic theological circles um, and in the Vatican, and that was to raise questions about, um, to put it in the terms that Ratzinger himself used in a very um, famous, some would say infamous, um, a statement or declaration that he made while he was in charge of the Congregation for the Doctrine uh, of the Faith, uh, a document called Dominus Jesus, in that the title of that document was on the, the Latin was unicitas, or the unicity of Jesus, the uniqueness of Jesus, wow. that I was questioning wh whether Jesus is the one and only Savior of all humankind, the one and only full re revelation of God's truth to all of humanity for all time. To question that uh, was um, to, to skirt on the, on the, on the precincts of, of heresy. Uh, and that was, that was the issue. Well, did you think that the critics, your critics had your views right? I mean, they understood what you were saying? Uh, <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> and maybe one that could still get you in trouble if you answer it. No, no, no problem. I'm, 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 uh, um, I'm now that I'm retired and I'm, I've really had no trouble within the last 15 years. Uh, no, they got, they got it pretty right. Yeah. But I'm among us, uh, one of those um, uh, Catholic theologians, and I still very much want to present myself and function as a Catholic theologian, um, who are raising the question of, whether it is essential to Christianity to continue to maintain that that Jesus uh, of Nazareth is the fullness and the final um, revelation of God's God's truth, and and the approach I take, Bob, w without getting into too much of the theological complexities, is that we have to face this issue um, insofar as the Catholic Church 
since the Second Vatican Council, um, 1962 to 1965, um, parenthetically, I had the good fortune to be a young uh, student of theology in Rome just during those years of, of the council. Um, but at that council, in the, in the declaration of the council uh, called Nostra Aetate, on the church's attitude towards non-Christian religions, mm -hmm. the Catholic Church explicitly calls all Christians, all Catholics, to engage in an authentic dialogue. Mm -hmm. Colloquium is the Latin word. Mm -hmm. To a, 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 a genuine dialogue with persons of other religions because they recognize the value of other religions. Now, how are you going to really engage in an open-minded dialogue with others when you when you believe that God has dealt you all the aces, yeah. you know, in, in, in this in this game of of, of a dialogue, so there's a, so there's a, a, con a contradiction between the call to to act in dialogue and in the theology mm -hmm. that, that contradicts dialogue. Mm -hmm. So that's the issue that I and other theologians like Roger Haidt. Um, at the theological seminary, mm -hmm. are trying to engage. Mm -hmm. Well, as you can hear, my, my dogs are upset about your position as well. <laughs> you uh, must be Catholic. <laughs> yes, it's it's uh, uh, they're very they're very dogmatic. <laughs> oh, um, bad, bad, bad. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it was not planned. I didn't <laughs> tell them to bark. That was not a planted joke. It was just Dark. a bad. It was a bad, spontaneous joke. Um. Okay, so that's among that's among your offenses, and it's very much related to what we're going to talk about. Uh, and you were thinking about this, uh, I guess, fairly fairly early on. I mean, one of your one of your better known books, I think, is "No Other Name?" Yeah. Question mark A critical survey of Christian attitudes toward world religion. So you've been you've been thinking about the issue of religious dialogue and religious pluralism for a long time. Right, right. I mean, I started out my earlier life. I was. Uh, um, I was a member of a religious order that was a missionary order, the Divine Word Missionaries, and I was an ordained priest at the time. And I was that was a part of my life as I was supposed to go out and engage and convert persons of other religions. And at the time, I and so many others were fi trying to figure out what does this mean? What, why, what, what do missionaries? What are missionaries meant to accomplish? So. I, I um, from from those early years, um, this was a a a question which was not, to be honest with you, Bob, not just an academic question. It is that mm -hmm. you know we have to do the history, study the 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 witness of the scriptures. It was a personal question. I I, I like many other Christians, um, I'm talking about mainline Christians, mm -hmm. just have trouble believing. Um, that Jesus is the one and only Savior, and Christianity is the one and only religion meant to um, to embrace, to engage, to replace all other religions. That just it not only does it not make intellectual sense; it's politically dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it can justify, as it has, all kind of Western imperialism and colonialism. I, don't, I mean, I don't want to get into all the cliches of accusations, but I think there is a real relationship between the theological position that says we have the one and only Savior and the political position that we have the best system um, meant to, mm -hmm. to bring salvation, political and, and human salvation to all the world. Mm -hmm. I think they're related. Okay. I'm not, not the only one who said that, of course. Okay, then so of all the religions, the non-Christian religions out there, you developed a, a kind of a special relationship with Buddhism, I guess, so far as your personal practice goes. That's right. That's right. What attracted to you you to Buddhism to begin with? How, how, did, how did this start? Well, I think, and it started when I began teaching courses on Buddh Buddhism and Buddhist-Christian dialogue back in the 80s uh, at Xavier University. Um, and I think the thing that attracted me in the beginning, and still does, is the emphasis that Buddhism places on the necessity of all religious beliefs and commitments being based on one's own personal real experience. Mm -hmm. And so the stress, and so they, they, they say, if you're going to 
And, you know, as, as Buddha says, don't follow me because of all the authorities. These were his last words, some, some people claim. Follow me because it makes sense to you, because you have felt what I have felt. So that, and then they, not only do they say that that experience is essential to, re, to religious practice and faith, but then they give you, <laughs> this is the, then they give you very precise, concrete methods for pursuing such experience that comes under the broad rubric of, um, of meditation mm. and the various forms of meditation. So that's what, what, um, what, what caught, uh, caught, just attracted me, claimed me in, in the beginning. And then, and then I, I just found that in carrying on my work, as a Christian theologian, the job of a theologian is, to put it very simply, but I think accurately, is to make sense for our present time uh, of the traditional teachings and beliefs of a particular religion, in this case, Christianity. You know, how does it make sense today? Um, and I found myself more and more just appealing to or turning to what what I had learned about Buddhism and its teachings to 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 throw light, kind of like a you know the, a hermeneutical flashlight that I used as I explored many of to, of the of the ba very basic uh, questions of my Christian belief. You know, what is God? What is the purpose of creation? How is Jesus Savior? What happens to us after? Uh, after after death, and especially how can we engage to change the world? On all of these issues, I just found myself um, uh, using a kind of a Buddhist and looking at these questions, exploring them with Buddhist glasses, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I, I, I came to a point in early two thousand, around two after I took an early retirement from from Xavier University in two thousand and two. I just figured I had to I had to sort this out. I mean. How much of me is a Buddhist and how much of me is a Christian? And by the way, what is the current ratio? <laughs> well, 50-50. Um, 50-50, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so give us an example then uh, of what you just talked about, where a, a particular Buddhist idea uh, or, or practice or whatever, um, maybe an idea actually, uh, illuminates for you your kind of Christian ideas and helps you understand your your native faith better in a way than you had before yeah. or more fully. Yeah. Well, I think I mean to start with the with the really big question. Um, you know, what am I affirming when I say I believe in in God? Mm -hmm. um, um, and for you know, for so much, and I'm 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 not alone here. I mean the, the 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 traditional the way of speaking about God, um, what we yeah yes it's in the New Testament and the in the Jewish Bible what what Christians call the Old Testament, um, it's but it's in day, in Sunday sermons. I mean to talk about God as 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 a being an entity that that has God's that well we use a male pronoun has his existence um, in some way outside of. Of the world, and then decides to create the world, and then there's the world here and God there, and and then there's got to be a, a bridge between the two, and that bridge becomes uh, um, becomes Jesus, um, and 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 God's then relationship is a matter of God intervening, and God intervening here, but not there, mm -hmm. and so the, it's it's uh, it comes under the rubric of dualism, Bob, mm -hmm. um, the the uh, kind of a dualistic. Um, uh, substantive understanding of of God, which um, is just hard to make make sense of. I mean, in the light of of especially in the light of science, um, you know, and and where 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 does science see the 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 intervening of God um, in, in, in into the work of creation and the ongoing evolution of of, of, of the world and the universe? So um, I mean, and and so then. Then when I when I turn to Buddhism, especially especially Mahayana Buddhism, right? There are um, two two basic kinds of Buddhism. I mean, at least most most Buddhisms fall either under the Mahayana <clears throat> rubric or the Theravada rubric, right? 
Most mm-hmm. most Buddhists fall under the Mahayana. I think most Buddhists in the world. Uh, right, right. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. The majority does. Yeah. I mean, um, and so, but their notion, and and of course, you know, this is th- th- Buddhism is. Um, um, I, I mean, I would. Some people say, well, Buddhism is an atheistic religion. Um, I would really want to qualify that or um, and say, no, it's a non-theistic religion. And I, and I should say that here, I think you're 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 talking at a fairly theological level to be, well, theological <laughs> at a fairly philosophical level to begin with. Here, I mean, if you go to Asia and look at actual Buddhists, you will find them making entreaties to supernatural beings for 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 things. I mean, they might not they don't believe in a creator god, but there is. Certainly, in everyday practicing Buddhism in Asia, there's a lot of what you could call supernatural stuff. But at this, but but I think you're, I think the the point you're making is that when you look at kind of Buddhist philosophy, in other words, the counterpart of Christian theology, you might say, that's what gets accused of being atheistic. I guess, right? The the if that makes sense. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But 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 Bob, even if you. Um, of course, you're going to, and I, I, I certainly recognize the value and the power of of popular religion, mm-hmm. you know, but but um, right now the form of Buddhism that I, and by the way, my wife as well, who has become a Buddhist, um, the the form of Buddhism that we practice is more Tibetan Buddhism for the first oh. for the for the first uh, maybe. Um, fifteen years of my life as a uh, as a as a Buddhist Christian, um, I, it was more the practice of Zen. Yeah. Uh, since then, though, um, since since what? Since about two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, um, I I have been practicing more a form of Tibetan Buddhism, mm-hmm. and Tibetan Buddhism recognizes the value, if not the need, of gods. Of, right. of okay. bodhisattvas. I mean, right. that's just not something that you know people right. do. When they, right. when they, but they all, they, the, the teaching is very clear. Not that every single Tibetan Buddhist will understand it that way, but the teaching is very clear. Is that when you rep, represent, when you image, as we do in our meditations, when you image Buddha, or when you, when you, when you image Tara, when you image various bodhisattvas. Um, and you and you, and they're right in front of you, and you're and you're praying to them, and you're asking for help, and you're taking refuge in them. My God, just just the way I did with Jesus when I was in the seminary, um, they always end up, and and then you let the images go. The images are there to stir your imagination and your feelings, uh, to open your brain, um, you know, to to receive the the energy. Uh, of that that is embodied in these images, you let them go, and as you you merge with them, mm-hmm. you be, you become them, and so it's it's you 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 use the images as real sacraments in, in terms of Christian Christian language, you know, to embody the the, the mystery, the, to embody what what they call the the interconnected energy, mm-hmm. um, and, and and but but the the final phase. Is a non-dualistic merging where you are the Buddha, hmm. and the Buddha is you. And then you, I hear, hear that phrase, and I say, "My God, that's what Paul said." Saint Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, he said, "It is no longer I who live; it's Christ who's doing the living in me." So I, I just said, "Wow!" I mean, the the, the possibilities for this kind of uh, of dialogue is. Um, is not just exciting intellectually, but deeply satisfying spiritually, personally. Okay. And that was a, now you're referring to Tibetan meditation when you talk about the envisioning of the, yeah, Tibetan yes. is known for doing a lot of kind of envisioning. It's very kind right. of semagistic yes. in, in contrast uh, to some other things like Zen, like like Vipassana, I guess. Um, Maybe that's why I like Tibetan because it's so Catholic. It's a lot of smells and bells. <laughs> Yeah, e- even if they're in your head. Um, the the um, so uh, okay. So what's an what's an example of a Buddhist idea? I mean, in your book, you talk about all the big ones. Uh, you know, not self uh, or anatta. Um, 
emptiness, well, sunyata, word sometimes yeah. translated as emptiness. Um, we've all heard of nirvana. Um, mm. w- what's, uh, what's an example? T- 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 why don't you take one of those and tell us uh, maybe what you think in Christian theology it corresponds to, um, but in any, at any rate, how it kind of, um, how you related to it as a Christian, how maybe it illuminated Christianity for you. Okay, let, maybe let take the, um, we'll just take the Buddhist ideal um, uh, of enlightenment. Okay. Which, which kind of can serve in a, um, in a, in a relational analogous way to the Christian notion of salvation. It's what, what, what Christians are after, what Buddhists are after. Christians are after salvation. Buddhists are after enlightenment. And to understand enlightenment is, again, speaking especially as a, as a Mahayana Tibetan um, a Buddhist, um, enlightenment is to wake up to your to what you really are. Mm -hmm. And what you really are is a, um, well, in their language, you are a Buddha. You wake up to your Buddha nature. Now that's that's an an image, that's a symbol, and to try to explore it a little bit more, you wake up to the fact that you are, language limps here, you are part of, you you are contained within and an expression of, the interconnected emptiness of all reality. And when I, by, by emptiness, nothing exists by it. It's empty of all selfhood. Everything exists through relationship with others. You're part of that. Right. Not, now, nothing, nothing exists kind of in a self-sufficient way. Everything is so interconnected that it becomes misleading to think of things as having bounds. Exactly. Yeah. That your primary identity is, re, you're not a substance, a, a thing that then relates you're a relationship that takes the form of a thing, <laughs> mm-hmm. temporarily, temporarily. You, you are the sum of a bunch of relationships with the world. Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Now, waking up to that, um, for me, I take that concept, and I'm, again, I, I'm not alone in doing this, but um, I, I take that concept and I apply it to the Christian belief that Jesus is divine that Jesus is the Son of God, Mm -hmm. that Jesus is Savior. And uh, I I say, well, would that be, the Buddhist notion of waking up to what you really are, be a contemporary, not just a contemporary, but but a, a meaningful way of trying to figure out, trying to express, trying to feel in your own faith, what it means to say that this Jesus of Nazareth, born at a certain time in, in history, is divine. Um, Christians have, have, there are many ways in which they, they, they try to talk about that. One of them is, is this notion of, well, he, he has two natures and one person. So a divine nature, a human nature, but there's only one person. Mm-hmm. Where's the per- That's one way. But how about looking upon the, the Christian belief in the divinity of Jesus as Jesus as someone who, like Buddha, fully woke up to what he really was. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. And what he really was, was he was indeed a, now he's, he was Jewish, and Jewish at that time, he was someone who was fully in communion with, in connection with, um, what he called Abba, of, of God was like a, a father. Um, and not only that, but then they also used language in the early church that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Ah, Jesus goes into the desert. The Spirit leads him. He's, he's fully responsive to the Spirit. This, by the way, is what is called in Christian um, uh, a lingo a spirit Christology, an understanding of Jesus by way of the spirit. So waking up to one's true nature, waking up to the spirit that is given to him in his very being, becoming fully transparent to that spirit, um, allowing that spirit to express, to reveal what what God, what what the spirit God in, intended 
for the Jewish people at that time in history when they were when they were um, colonized by the by the Roman Empire. Um, Jesus becomes an expression of that and um, shows what are the possibilities for his followers, in fact, for all human beings. So this is, again, I mean, something that it just makes so much more sense out of my tri traditional Christian beliefs. And then, it, and, and they say, well, you're just imposing Buddhism on Christianity. And I say, well, wait a minute. Buddhism has been the occasion for me to go back to the New Testament, to Luke's gospel, for instance, or to Paul's letters, and to see all the times that, that the, the language that was used about Jesus and the Spirit, Jesus waking up to the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Um, so it, it, that would be an example, I think, of, of, of what is called now um, in, in contemporary uh, theology, comparative theology, mm -hmm. where, where one religion understands itself through dialogue with another religion, and in my case, through dialogue with Buddhism. And this is a, there's a, it's a growing field. Um, in a few weeks, I'm going to be going to the American Academy of Religion convention um, in Atlanta, and there is a, a, a group, a Society of Buddhist Christian um, Studies of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist scholars and Christian scholars who are not just scholars, but they practice their, their, their individual faiths, talking to each other um, in an effort to, to, to learn and to reinterpret themselves in the conversation with the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, I mean, first of all, I see in a way more fully how, how you see uh, Buddhism helping you get over the, the issue of kind of the otherness of God, because in this case, Jesus looks a little less like the other than Jesus might have looked before, in the sense that, for one thing, Jesus as I understand it, is, in your view, realizing a capability that lies within everyone, uh, which involves grasping their interconnection, their, mm -hmm. their connection. And, and as you note, um, interconnection, uh, this idea of interconnection is what is among, is what is at least in part signified by this Buddhist doctrine of emptiness. I mean, when people yeah. hear emptiness, they say, okay, well, I, medi you know, I, I meditated, you know, so long and hard that I really felt the emptiness of everything. That doesn't sound very inspiring, but you're right. <laughs> what it means is the interconnection of everything. And that leads us to another doctrine, which is probably gets more relative emphasis in Theravadan Buddhism. I, I think emptiness is kind of, you could almost say, is, is almost a big thing in Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. In Theravadan Buddhism, I think you. I think you basically hear the equivalent of, of of emptiness, sometimes called different things like formlessness. But there may be more relative emphasis in Theravadan on the idea of not self or no self, anatta. Although that's certainly part of Mahayana Buddhism. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But but one interesting thing is what they have in common, which is part of the way of explaining what they mean by not self, is again saying you are so, it isn't just that everything out there is so interconnected as to start to, in a certain sense, lose some of its autonomous identity. It's that you are so interconnected with everything that the bounds of the self uh, start to lose meaning, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, just what that means, personally or existentially, that the bounds uh, of the self the boundaries of the self start to lose meaning. This is where I think Mahayana brings out much more explicitly than Theravada. I don't want to get into these arguments. It's like Catholic, Protestant, mm -hmm. Ma, you know, Theravada, Mahayana. But but I think each each tradition emphasizes different things. But for the Mahayanas, when you start to wake up to your reality as an interconnected, constantly um, evolving, constantly changing um, being, which is called wisdom, prajna, that's, that's what you wake up to. As soon as that really starts to take place, prajna, wisdom, becomes karuna, compassion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the interconnectedness mm -hmm. is 
you start caring for others just as much as you care about yourself. Because the rest of the world seems as much a part of you, in a sense, as you you proper do. Exactly. There are really, as my teacher puts it, there are really, I mean, ontologically, if you want to put it that way, there is, um, there's no real difference between you and the other. Yes, at the moment, consciousness, right? But in your fundamental constitution, what's going on is you are, we are both, you and I talking right now, are both of both parts of the same, the same interconnected, the, the term that Thich Nhat Hanh uses, I just love, is the same interbeing. Mm -hmm. We are all part, and therefore, um, the commandment, this is again relationship to Christianity, the commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is no longer a commandment. It's what you do mm -hmm. when you start waking up. It, it, just, feels, it just feels natural. It feels you don't, you don't do it out of obedience to an abstract yeah. principle. Mm -hmm. And so if ever you have to, you know, now we're getting into a whole other issue, but if ever you have to um, contradict, oppose, um, if, I, if I think you are doing something that is harmful to you or to others, mm -hmm. and I, out of compassion, it's out of compassion that I resist you. That I oppose you, so it's I, I I I'm not doing it because I think you're a you know no you're 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 I'm not doing it because I think you're evil. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because I care about you. And and I and I know what you're doing is you're doing it because you, you haven't wake you you haven't started to wake up right. to what you really are. And as long as you're caught in avidya in in ignorance, you're going to be selfish. Because mm -hmm. you're going to be afraid. You're going to have to protect yourself. Okay. Now, have you, um, meditatively, how strongly have you apprehended these things? I mean, the, the, uh, the two big ones, I guess, emptiness or sunyata and not self or anatta. Have you had, you know, well, there's both the question of ha have you had these particularly powerful experiences of these things? And there's also the question of, to what extent is it almost an ongoing thing? Does it change your, your everyday consciousness? But um, uh, first of all, have you had some specific amazing experiences? No. <laughs> <laughs> how, how disappointing. Well, you know, really, in terms of having, you know, there are some Buddhists, some Zen schools that talk about, you know, sudden in, in enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know, more the Rinzai. And the Soto Zen people talk about it's gradual. Mm -hmm. It's it's not, and I, I have not I've never had the kind of experience where uh, suddenly all the lights go on, suddenly I I I, I feel it. Um, you know, it, it, I'm knocked off my say like Saint Paul on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. I'm knocked off my horse. Um, no, but 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 Bob, I, and there, I mean there have been moments sitting in meditation, or. Um, at at the Eucharist, uh, after receiving Holy Communion, mm -hmm. um, where I just kind of sit in silence, in in a, in a sense of this feeling, you know, uh, the way one Christian mystic puts it, put it, uh, Julian of Norwich, all is well, mm. all's well, no matter what's going on, all is well, and 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 in a sense of just being. A part of others. I mean, it, it again. It's 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 not tr it's not thunderous, um, but but it's it's there. It's there, and 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 I and I guess you know I I I I, I find it more, more also also in moments of 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 anxiety or of fear uh, or of insecurity. Um, where I'm anxious, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, am I going to do this, or did I do that well enough, or what's going to happen when I do? Um, those are moments when I say, "Whoop, be aware of that thought, accept it," mm -hmm. and and the the actual problem becomes an occasion to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And that's that's very much uh, in 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 our Tibetan and, practice. 
And I would say that that would be an experience that may be familiar to people who've done much in the way of mindfulness meditation. Yes, I mean, that's yeah. certainly part of the idea of mindfulness meditation is to be right. uh, aware of your of, of feelings, including unpleasant ones like anxiety, mm -hmm. um, in a way that allows that helps you uh, elude their grasp in a certain sense, become less in the thrall of them, less controlled by them, and more yeah. more an observer of them. See, but but here, this is interesting, Bob. You know what you just described: practice of mindfulness would be especially um, in in the Theravadan mm -hmm. form of mind, mindfulness. You just you're aware of your thought. You realize your thought is not you, mm -hmm. uh, and so in a sense that frees you, and it does, and it's powerful. In the D Tibetan practice that I that I follow, a kind of uh, it's called Zogchen, um It's not just that you become aware of your thoughts, whether of fear, of anxiety, of insecurity, mm -hmm. um, and that, that it is, you know, it is just a thought. But part of that waking up is the, the, also the awareness that you are, this is the Tibetan, you are held in, in a, the term one of the Tibetan teachers uses, you are held in an essence love in a love and a, and, and, and a connectedness he doesn't use connectedness is a stokni rinpoche and a love essence there is just an ontological that's my language love that holds you mm -hmm. so it's just it's not only that your thoughts are not you but what you really are is part of of the nature of mind that's the term the, the, the this the universal compassionate mind that is that we are of which we are all expressions so you see there's the the added and uh, there's a belief in there there too it's not just yeah just, it's not just psychological if i may say so it's right. also theological yeah well I, I i suspect that if if in theravada say within the vipassana tradition that uh i think if, if you follow the logic of of, of say mindfulness meditation far enough um, there is a, a philosophy and a metaphysics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there, and I believe there would be notions of maybe something like pure awareness. Yep. That, yep. Yep. that you become that, that, that you manifest when you are liberated from the kind of, you might say distortions of awareness that are, that are more common in, in the way we live our lives or something. So, so, I mean, there is, you know, I, I, I only say that because I think, there is a, vir a virtually now secular Western form of mindfulness meditation that's become severed from its, yep. its Asian philosophical roots. And uh, that's not, it doesn't have to be that way. There are places even in the United States where you can, you know, go to Vipassana retreats. And if you explore enough and talk to your teacher enough, you'll find that there are these uh, more kind of elevated ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you mentioned Christian mystics. Um, what... Uh, you know, mysticism is a is a hard term to define, and uh, I'm I'm interested in the question of whether the Christian mystics, you know, ranging from uh, I don't know uh, way back to all the way up to uh, Thomas Merton and beyond, I guess, whether they are in some sense fundamentally doing the same thing, feeling the same thing, maybe even believing the same thing as uh, some Asian mystics. Um, and I know you uh, you talk about this in the book. Um, for starters, though, what is there a good definition of mysticism that allows you to even, you know, start thinking about this? I, I mean, or just take the Christian mystics. Is there something they all have in common beyond powerful subjective experience? Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it 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 it, it revolves mysticism at least Christian mysticism now. Mm -hmm trying to talk about Christian mm -hmm. mysticism, all, I mean, has to do with um, recognizing, um, sensing, um, being touched by unity with God, mm -hmm. where, where there is the, the, the separation between the individual and the reality, the divine mystery, um, lessons. You know, and, and then, you know, the Christian mystics have to struggle with this a little bit more than, say, maybe Asian 
of a Buddhist mystics because of of the language of God as as as, as personal. Um, but it, it's it's a it's a blurring of division of of, of separation. Okay. Um, you know that that um, that produces a a sense of uh, of groundedness uh, of peace um, of, of of resourcefulness. Um, so I think that's would be would be the um, I mean at least one of the primary characteristics. So, so, so when you put it that way, you can see how it relates in a way both to the Buddhist experience of not self oh, and yeah. to the experience of emptiness as we define it, because both involve a certain um, kind of dissolution of the bounds of of your own self, right? And, and a lessened sense of separation from uh, the rest of reality. Mm -hmm. And and maybe in the process, reality comes to seem more, I don't want to use a more Christian term like divine, but reality is seeming like a good thing at, the, at that point. Yes. I mean, it's th that's it. And, and and this has been hard for me sometimes, you know, to, um, yeah, to, to, to understand and to, uh, to affirm within my Buddhist teachings and is that basically, um, you know, the way they, the way they put it, all is well. The, just you accept the reality the way it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, now accept doesn't mean approve of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it, you you're it, you're able to see that no matter what is going on. Um, Jesus, I even hesitate to say it. Um, it's okay. Yeah. And all of my all of my Christian. Um, um, training and beliefs and commitments about liberation theology, mm -hmm. you know, which has been a very formative part of my, of my, both my, edu my theology and my spirituality, that, that we are called to transform this world because of the, of, of, of injustice, that just, um, um, and I know talking about this, for instance, at Beckett Union with, a little yeah. bit with, with Jim Cohn, you know, um, the, the father was, of well, black, yeah. black liberation theology. Right. You know, they they're wary of Buddhism because it seems it seems to lead to a kind of acceptance of the status quo, which is not the case. I mean, which is not the case. That's why I have to. I, they, I have but, to keep. But there mind. is. Uh, you, it's not the case because uh, it does not uh, it does not weaken your sense of commitment to helping those in need and so on. At the same time. Uh, yeah, that is, as you go about living your everyday life, in fact, it may be more infused with compassion than it was before. At the same time, there's that moment you described when it seems like all is well, and I'm sure that's what they take issue with, right? Is like, yes, no, yes. all is not bad as a delusion. All is not well, so long as people are suffering. See, but of course, that this is the paradox. I mean, if you want to call it a paradox, I'm going to say a contradiction, but I think it's a paradox. Because Buddha himself, what is, what's the first noble truth? There is suffering, mm -hmm. and what motivate he wanted to do something about suffering. Mm -hmm. That was his whole motivation to free us mm -hmm. from suffering. Um, so, so I mean, this, this, the, the in Buddhism, you respond when you see, you know, the, you know, the, the, the rich landowner t stealing land from, 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 the, from. The, from the campesino, you know, when you see, you know, the the, the treatment the, in 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 the, in the sex trade and exploitation, I mean, you, 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 in a sense, you say no, that should not be. But you know that even that, even what is happening there. Now, this is the hard part for me too, and maybe I'm translating this too much into my Christian language. But even that kind of horrible suffering is held in the interconnectedness of it all. Mm -hmm. That too is part of, of inter, interbeing. And therefore, because it is, you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. it sounds but, like you, but you have to, just to finish this, mm -hmm. but, but you have to be in the Buddhist stress. I mean, you remember in the book, the way I put it, the, the Christian stress is, if you want peace, work for justice. Get out there and change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, I think that's so important. But the Buddhists say, if you want justice, um, then work for peace within yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, to, to, to make Thich Nhat Hanh's beautiful, powerful phrase, if you want to make peace in the world, you first have to be peace in, within yourself. Yeah, the, the analogy I've heard is to those signs in the airplane, you know, in the airplanes where they say, in the event of an emergency, 
first secure your own <laughs> yeah. oxygen mask yeah. 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 Before, yeah. You, yeah. before you try to help other people with their oxygen masks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay. So th this it almost sounds uh, like a little bit of a, a kind of a for that moment you're describing as a kind of a an experiential a felt solution of the problem of evil in a certain sense. I mean, what Christians call the problem of evil. You know, why is there suffering? It doesn't make sense. For for a moment there, it sounds like not that you start thinking of suffering as a good thing, but it all fits together in some sense. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it all can, it all fits together. It's all working out. And of course, for Buddhists, you, you, Christians have a problem of evil because they their understanding of God is as this omnipotent agent mm -hmm. that really is in charge mm -hmm. at all times. Whereas for Buddhists, um, there the, the <laughs> Interbeing, if you want to talk about a god or a an ultimate, an ultimate maybe, the ultimate is part of the process. It's 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 there within the process. There's there's no one in charge, right? Um, and yet and yet there is a energy and a resourcefulness within it all that can always be tapped. That is, or it is always there. Tapped is maybe not the best word. It, it's always there, um, and when things get messy, you know, on the on the human level, that's kind of that form of evil, Bob. And I know you've dealt with this a lot in your books, but that form of evil, what is called moral or human evil, that for Buddhists is easy, <laughs> as it were. That's due to ignorance. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's and wait a minute, that doesn't simplify it. I mean, pe because people are ignorant, they do horrible things. But on the next, on the level of what is called sometimes in natural evil, you know, volcanoes and and earthquakes um, and cancer, um, that is part of again, God doesn't dread. That's that's part of the 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 the, the way the world works. Um, and there's going to be there's going to be Collisions and there's going to be to to be to be um, suffering in the sense of the these collisions, but we're always there. It's always possible to respond to it with compassion. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well we've we've been talking for a while, and it's probably about time we stop. But I'm curious about one more um, one more Buddhist concept. What if anything it corresponds to in Christianity, and that's maybe the most famous uh, Buddhist concept: a layperson nirvana. The uh, which is, you know, kind of what happens when you get uh, enlightened and or liberated. And by the way, it seems that one other thing that Buddhism kind of has in common with Christianity in Buddhism, there's an extremely explicit connection between enlightenment and liberation. In oh, yeah, that's not so central in Christianity, but you certainly it, Jesus says the truth will set you free. Mm hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, so this, I just wanted to kind of nod to that possible parallel, but also at the same time uh, ask you the original question, which is, is there something that nirvana corresponds to in Christianity? Well, um, it, you, know, you know, it's, it's all, uh, oftentimes paired, you know, it's, it's not, nirvana is paired with heaven, mm -hmm. you know, as the goal. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhists are, are after nirvana and ultimately in, after their many, many existences, they, they will end up in, in the state of nirvana, full nirvana. And Christians have this notion of heaven. But what I, what I think um, both of, of the, what, what, what Christians are reminded of through the, the dialogue with, with the Buddhist understanding of nirvana is that heaven is not... <laughs> You know, it's not a it's not a place you go to after death. I mean, we, who knows what happens after death? But I mean, but heaven is is a is is a state that you can achieve mm -hmm. with you know in Christian terms by following Jesus by opening yourself to the to the to the Holy Spirit. A state in which, as we're getting back, you sense your unity with God, mm -hmm. um, and that takes can can take place before death. That can take place in this life. In other words, as, G as, we, as Christians pray in the Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's to be, it's to be realized on earth. Um, and so I, I mean, I think there, this is where, where, um, you know, I think there, there is the possibility of, of Christians, um, kind of repossessing some of their own, the, their own beliefs. But when you get to, to what actually happens after death, that, <laughs> that opens up. I've got one chapter in the book uh, on on life after death, and that's perhaps the one chapter where I'm I'm um, you know some would say really really heretical um, <laughs> because it, it's questioning whether we we live on as individual beings. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a little heretical. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but uh, maybe well, here it, it, that that heresy is in this table of contents. <laughs> which is part of this book. Uh, without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I really want to thank you for, for talking about this. It's been a lot of fun. I know you, well, have, I know you have a new uh, book, I, I think just coming out, kind of on this subject, but it's, it's in the form of a conversation between you and Roger Haight, who is, who is at Union and like you, has run afoul of uh, Catholic authorities in the course of his career. Um, and I gather the, the dialogue is kind of, he's kind of assuming more the Christian side of the dialogue. Oh, yes. He, and, and, at this training, he, he, before this book, he never studied about any, hardly anything of Buddhism. He is a trained, what they call a systematic uh, progressive, but a systematic uh, theologian. And so the, the idea was to engage um, a theologian who hadn't learned, known much about Buddhism, and to talk about what what such a theologian, what such a Christian could learn through a through this uh, opening up to to Buddhism. And what's that book called? It's called Jesus and Buddha: Friends in Conversation. And you and you and and Roger are the friends in conversation. Yep, but we hope that it, it kind of uh, it, that's primarily it. Yeah, the, and then there's the metaphorical meaning of yeah. Buddha and the Buddha and right. Jesus. Okay. Well, that yeah. sounds good, and uh, you know, maybe maybe we could get you and Roger on to just talk between yourselves about it, ab about the book. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, in any event, thanks, thanks so much, Paul. This has really been great. Oh, thank you, Bob. It's just been a delightful uh, opportunity to carry on our conversation and our friendship. Amen, as they say on uh, in one of these two religions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> take care. Bye bye.